Hello Internet, Russell with Symposia here. As some of you may be aware, there's been some recent drama in the world of entheogenic churches. On April 12th of this year, a preprint publication called Fungi Fiction, an analytical investigation into the Church of Silomathoxin's alleged novel compound by Samuel Wilson and Alexander Sherwood, was published on the website Chem Archive, which claims that the sacrament being sold by the Church of Silomathoxin is not what it claims to be. The publication notes, our findings revealed no evidence to suggest that the compound silamethoxin is present in samples of the material that the church is offering to their members online. Psilocybin, bayocystin, and psilocin were, however, unambiguously identified in the sample, suggesting that the claims regarding the biosynthesis of silamethoxin may be misguided. In response to the preprint, the Church of Silamethoxin published a statement which read, It should be noted that the church has never at any time laid claim to the fact that silamethoxin has ever been positively identified in its sacrament. Why? Because at this juncture, it is scientifically impossible to make such claims, as there is no reference sample in existence. Our claims to the existence of silamethoxin at this time are solely based on faith, bolstered by our members' own direct experiences with the sacrament. To be clear, this is the drug that the church was selling its paying members online as silamethoxin for $175 for a half ounce and $300 for a full ounce. They're now claiming as a response to their drug being tested that they have never claimed that it was positively identified in their sacrament. To get a better idea of how the church does talk about and market its sacrament, my colleague David Nichols and I listened to a number of interviews with the creators of the church. So the following is them in their own words discussing their church and their sacrament. Okay, so let's talk about the church. So the church of Silomethoxin, what is it? What is it doing? Who's who's behind it all? And how do people get involved? And in, are in Okay, so the principals are the founders. It's me, Ian Ben Weiss, my partner, uh, our other veteran cohort, Benjamin Moore, and then another veteran, uh, Ryan Bajan. It's us four that, that got together and decided to start the church back over well over a year ago. Um, and so, yeah, the church, you know, our main thing is, is getting people sacrament, right? So people sign up, there's a membership application. If we feel comfortable that you're being sincere, um, that you can be responsible working with the sacrament, we, we will accept you. Let's start talking about silomethoxin. Let's just kind of start with, with what is this? Where does it come from? Who figured this out? So let, let's, let's get into that. Let, what, let's start with what is it? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So, silomethoxin is a 4 hydroxylated version of 5 MeO-DMT. Um, it was first synthesized in 1965 by the Pasteur Institute. Um, in order to synthesize, it requires a very intricate 10-step process that takes close to three days, from what I'm being told. Um, and so, because of that, it never really was picked up. So, you know, 1965 was not too long before the Controlled Substances Act, too. So that obviously probably killed any uh, chance that that was going to get any attention and, and, and ran with. So as far as, and again, this is just the history as far as we know it, is that, you know, past that point, it kind of went into the history books. And, you know, no one, especially anyone who w- wasn't wanting to try to do that because of the legalities involved with it. Um, and then in 2007, Alexander Shulgin, uh, on his website, cognitiveliberty.org, published a response to a letter he got asking about silomethoxin. And, um, you know, he noted that there were people in Germany who at the time were feeding other synthetic tryptamines to mushroom substrates and getting four hydroxylated versions of it uh, in, in the mushroom fruiting body. And so in that letter, the person asked, he said, I theorize that if you throw or were to mix in a 5 meo DMT salt to a, to a growing mushroom substrate, um, that it would produce silomethoxin. Um, and so that kind of got stuck back on the internet, I guess, just kind of shoved away in, in the internet somewhere. And, um, Ian, my law partner, um, stumbled across it and Ian being the person he is had access to the resources uh, to, to try this. And so, yeah, so it was tried. Um, as far as we know, it was successful on the very first run. Obviously we've tweaked the process and are continuing to tweak the process as we move forward. But, 
Yeah, I mean, I'll never forget the first time I received some. You know, they were they were mushroom fruiting bodies dried, but I, I mean, I noticed there was no bluing or or any kind of bruising on them, right? So I was fascinated, and um, you know, within a couple of weeks, took my first dose and said, "Man, this is incredible." And you know, I'll say this is that I was never a real big microdoser ever. I was more of a you know, let's go deep occasionally type person. But working with the Solomethox and microdoses is just, I mean, it's been incredible. Yeah. So I, I don't know if either one of you are able to answer this question, but it, it certainly is a very interesting question. Um, I mean, we don't have a mycologist or a botanist here, but the idea that you could take 5-MeO-DMT and you just introduce that into the substrate of the mushroom, and then the mushroom produces 4-hydroxy-5-MeO-DMT while also not producing 4 hydroxy DMT, which is psilocybin. I mean, how, 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 how does that work? Why does why does the mushroom make a 4 hydroxy 5 meo DMT, but not 4 hydroxy DMT? I mean, that's just that's so fascinating. And, and, and you know, so that's a very good question. And look, I am no chemist or bioscientist or anything like that. But and Ian could tell you a lot better than I could his theory behind it. But Boiled down, it's like this. A, the mushrooms see the 5-MeO-DMT as food, and the process for them to 4-hydroxylate the 5-MeO-DMT is much quicker and efficient than doing the synthesis into 4-hydroxylated DMT. And so because it's quicker, efficient, and actually feeds the process somehow, they choose to work with it. And now, you know, when we first started, we had to gauge amounts of 5-MeO-DMT to put on there, and we did figure out that you have to saturate it to a certain level to make sure that it doesn't produce psilocybin, right? So there's that saturation level where, you know, more times than not, there will be either none or, or very little psilocybin content in there. This last week I took three on an empty stomach in the afternoon. I had eaten some breakfast and had some coffee earlier in the morning. And so for me about 20 minutes in, I started to kind of notice, okay, this, it kind of, it definitely was not psilocybin, but it reminded me it's of mushrooms in the sense that kind of like, okay, there's I'm feeling my hands are a little bit clammy and I'm feeling some sensations and some energies moving. For me personally, all of my experiences with the psilomethox and so far is, you know, people ask me like, well, is it really edible 5-MeO-DMT? And it's like, yeah, to the best of my way of describing it, that that's it seems like a totally legit way to describe what this molecule is. Yeah, it's got the 4-hydroxy on it, but that just makes it edible 5-MeO-DMT. So it's not as fast. It doesn't go bang in the same way, but the the energy of it, the feeling of it for me is identical, just you know, st- stretched out over a different format. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, the, the quick history is that uh, this was synthesized back in 1965, but not uh, preserved or bioassayed. And then in the 90s, an uh, East German researcher uh, fed different tryptamines to mushroom substrate and made these novel 4-hydroxylated compounds. And, uh, but as far as we know, same thing, not, uh, you know, not bioassayed. And then in 2005, uh, Sasha Shulgin, who we really consider a godfather of our church, uh, was asked a question about psilomethoxin and and said, uh, how come this isn't in uh, uh, TCAL, tryptamines I've known and loved? And Shulgin said, well, because it's never existed in nature. uh, And uh, but I I give you uh, even odds that if you uh, put 5-MeO-DMT and mushroom spores on the uh, cow manure, (laughs) that uh, you'll get psilomethoxin. And uh, so for, for, for me, I, you know, you know, working with, with 5-MeO-DMT, it's a super powerful medicine. And uh, I can see all the benefit, let's say, of the uh, release part in the deep, you know, aspect of the curve where you're getting, you know, more into unity consciousness. And then, of course, you know, on this other, uh, on the tail end of the curve, let's say that's where you're getting the more therapeutic aspect of being able to interact with someone and then the afterglow and everything. So I'm like, you know, how come no one's invented an oral 5-MEO? I know, you know, you can do that with MAIs, but we know through ayahuasca, you know, that's that's kind of tricky uh, Jedi stuff and, and you can do it. But, uh, you know, that doesn't really, uh, 
have it available for everybody. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I said, okay, if, 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 if Shulgin said that it's doable, I, I know people that are, you know, uh, grow mushrooms, I'm going to have somebody uh, do it for me so I can uh, find out if this is uh, true. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I honestly thought that there would, uh, be some psilocybin, you know, psilocin effect, right. Of, of the, of the experience. But it, it turns out instead that the, the psilocin part of the molecule, the four hydroxylated DMT, uh, function just to keep that monoamine oxidase, right, from uh, coming in and breaking it down, but it really just fully expresses as the 5-MeO part, so it makes it oral 5-MeO. And as soon as I tested that, because I'd worked with that medicine a lot and served it to other people, I uh, immediately started sharing it with uh, other people that are in the church, uh, uh, Ryan Bagan and, and Kayla, and, uh, and then Ben Moore, a veteran who's also in the church. And, uh, yeah, so we, d- we dieted the, that medicine for like five days and, you know, and stacked it and did 5-MeO with it, <laughs> yeah. right, to, to see the just, you know, sort of, uh, you know, how, how, how they crossed and intersected. And, uh, yeah, and then, and then this was, uh, uh, you know, November of 2021, and right? And, yeah, now, and now we, you know, shared it with thousands of people, and then we uh, went uh, kind of uh, – uh, pub, uh, you know, so- soft launch, as it were, in September, and came out publicly on uh, Veterans Day, eleven eleven, and now have been, uh, yeah, continuing from there. In summary, what we just listened to in those interviews was the co-founders of the Church of Silimethoxin very confidently discussing the chemical synthesis of the drug that they are claiming is silimethoxin and selling and endorsements from self-proclaimed 5-MeO-DMT guru Martin Ball for the product. Sherwood and Williamson's preprint calls all of these claims into question, as their analysis appears to make the case that the church was selling the equivalent of regular powdered magic mushrooms. The church is now claiming that the only proof they ever had of the claims for Silomethoxin's presence in their sacrament were based on faith. Hopefully the side-by-side of the church's response to analysis of their sacrament alongside how they describe their own sacrament was helpful to some of you out there. Uh, Thanks for tuning in.